COVID-19 pandemic has weighed heavily on millions of workers around the world, with many either losing their jobs or having their salaries cut. While many UAE employers reduced their staffing budgets last year to remain operational, the latest salary report by global recruitment consultancy Hayes paints a more positive picture for 2021. The report found that hiring activity started to pick up in the fourth quarter of last year, and this trend has continued into 2021. Meanwhile, 55% of employees are confident that their salaries will remain stable for the rest of this year. In fact, Hayes says in its report that it doesn't expect the pandemic to negatively affect salaries further in 2021, which is great news for employees. But the big question is, will our salaries increase this year or do we need to remain patient and hope that 2022 brings us financial rewards? Welcome to Pocketful of Dirhams. I'm Felicity Glover, the personal finance editor at The National. Joining me today is Chris Greaves, the managing director of Hayes in the Middle East. Before we start, don't forget to subscribe to Pocketful of Dirhams on your favorite podcasting app. Thank you very much for joining us this week, Chris. No problem. Good to be here. Excellent. So the past year has been very difficult for many employees, um, a lot of whom have lost their jobs or had their salaries reduced. Are you seeing an uptick in the jobs market already? Um, yes, we are. I think um, I would visualize it like a, a U-shaped trough, really. Um, so when we ran our annual salary survey at the end of November last year, uh, by that stage, nearly half of uh, the companies that we, uh, we surveyed said that they were already in business as usual or growth phase. And then when we look at our own indicators, which we measure monthly, I can tell you that our new job numbers in February and March of this year were the best uh, we've seen since March of last year. So March last year, we were heading into the trough in terms of new activity and new jobs. Uh, we've obviously had a, a very difficult year, but where we are right now, we're coming back out of the trough and heading in an upward direction. And I would expect to see that uh, to continue. Not, um, not, not in a crazy way, but um, steadily, incrementally, month on month, we're getting, we're getting slightly busier. That's really good news. So, you know, heading, you know, sort of into the second half of this year, do you think that there will be more jobs for people to apply for? And will salaries be, you know, sort of reinstated to previous levels or even people might start seeing some salary rises? Well, well firstly, on the, on the salaries, I think that um, a, a number of companies did take advantage of the government's offer to temporarily reduce salaries over the worst of the COVID period. And as far as we're concerned or we understand, most of those salaries have been reinstated to, to full level. There may be one or two um, outlier companies that are still struggling, but uh, as far as we're aware, in most cases, salaries have been reinstated. I think the second thing to bear in mind is that when we survey um, the, the working population about what's happened to their salary over a 12-month period, um, in any given year, about 30 to 40 percent of people report that their salary is higher in December than it was in January. But interestingly, the, 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 when we explore the reasons why, the, the biggest single reason every year is that um, they have moved jobs. So people have moved jobs and as a result of that, they've secured an increase in pay um, or they're still with their current employer at year end, but they've either had a promotion um, or their individual contribution has been recognized and they've secured a, an individual pay increase. And lagging some way behind as an explanation for a pay rise is a company-wide increase of, say, 3 or 4% or whatever. Um, so I think the, the emphasis is very much on the individual and what the individual does rather than sitting back and expecting that your company is going to give everyone um, a 3 or 4% pay rise across the board. That, uh, that's relatively rare. That's interesting. Um, so it's it's about being proactive and possibly even, you know, jumping jobs. I mean, COVID-19, I'm assuming from, from, you know, the results that you're talking about is not preventing people from moving jobs to, to boost their salary. Not, not, not at all. I think there was, um, there was a noticeable um, downtick in employment activity around, I would say, between, say, May and August of last year. Uh, but either side of that, and certainly into the, the later summer and autumn and coming up towards the year end, 
uh, some sectors have been quite busy hiring, and uh, not not across the board. I mean, clearly, if you're in uh, if you're in leisure or tourism um, or, or retail, they've been quite quite dampened down. But elsewhere, some sectors have been busy, and um, and yet yeah, companies are having to uh, pay good salaries or salary increases to attract the right talent. Absolutely, and just going back to the employees in the hardest hit sectors. I mean, there's a lot, you know, from retail and tourism and other sectors. What advice would you give to those people? You know, they've lost their job and, you know, perhaps they're struggling now to find new new employment. What do they need to do? Do they need to upskill? How can they move into an industry that's, you know, sort of doing well? Well, I, I think that's easier said than done because when you look at the, um, the, the nature of the jobs that we register from our clients, um, they actually can be very, very uh, technically demanding and very specific. So in the technology sector, uh, we're getting a lot of requirements for people who've got um, uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, people who've got a lot of experience in certain um, software development programs, Python, Golang, big data, cybersecurity. And you, know, you can't just go and learn that at the drop of a hat. I think what, what I would suggest is that um, realistically, People, most people are going to have to stay within the industry that they have um, they've progressed in so far. But really, I think to learn the ropes of the job application process and to try and figure out what it is that a company wants when they're interviewing someone. So, for instance, we see uh, well, one of our busy areas is sales. So uh, we do a lot of work with startup companies coming to the UAE, um, and the first person they hire is a salesperson. Uh, to get the business off, up and running and off the ground. Now, we see a lot of sales CVs or CVs from salespeople, um, but quite often there's no mention of uh, necessarily of what that person sold, uh, in what volume, whether they've hit targets, uh, whether they've earned bonuses, what kind of commissions they've earned, and so on. So that's a way of leading me into a general point about people, um, uh, and certainly job seekers, trying to figure out where they've added value to their, uh, in their previous employment and don't be afraid of articulating it. Um, I think the, the interview process from an employer point of view is all about identifying those people who can make uh, a big impact on the business. And if you're in any kind of job role where you feel you add value to an organization, either through cost savings or extra sales or um, uh, uh, developing new initiatives or ideas or programs or whatever it is, that really does need to come to the fore in, in a CV and in an interview as well. Um, I think a, a lot of CVs are generically bland and uh, maybe some people aren't too confident or, or, or aware of the fact they need to uh, stress the value add uh, when they're in a face-to-face meeting. So it's about um, taking all of your skills that you may not have you know, necessarily used in, in you know, the job that you had been doing previously, but taking them all in and really highlighting them for a job that you're going for. Uh, absolutely. And, and not just focusing on what you have done, but really trying to get under the skin of the, of the job that you may be applying for or, or even interview with and figuring out which part of your experience is going to be of most relevance in making that job a success. That would include soft skills, for example. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, if, there's, um, if there's any elements of um, uh, mixing or uh, interacting with other, with other people, either internal employees, building coalitions and partnerships and uh, whatnot internally or any external uh, contact with, with customers, uh, then absolutely soft skills, yes. So you also mentioned, um, you know, some of the better performing industries. Um, you mentioned technology, for example. What are, what are other, you know, some of the more in-demand sectors the areas I think where we're, we're probably have been busiest over this uh, last 12 months um, is we, d- we do a lot of recruitment at uh, a very senior level, at the boardroom level. So um, there's been a lot of hiring of, um, uh, of C-suite individuals who um, have got a lot of experience in business transformation, uh, turning organizations around. Um, we've got, so we do a lot of hiring into uh, sovereign wealth funds across the region who've been very busy looking at putting together teams of um, internationally experienced investment professionals um, so that the oil rich countries are still looking at um, acquiring assets overseas to, to, to build into their uh, sovereign wealth fund portfolio. And the family, uh, the big family firms across the region have uh, continued to what I would call modernize um, by bringing in internationally experienced senior personnel um, who can help them uh, reposition for a, for a, for a change market. So the senior hiring has been very busy. 
Um, sales, I've mentioned, um, has, has, have been busy as well across the spectrum, both um, product um, and service sales. Um, so services into education, um, products into uh, medical devices, into pipes, um, and whatever else you care to mention. So, so the, the sales roles have been coming in um, with, with regular frequency. And then, of course, uh, technology, um, both on a uh, fixed on a, on a contracting basis. So companies hiring individuals on a larger scale to undertake work on a, on a particular project, maybe a database transformation, and, and permanent hiring as well. And I think to, you know, to give you an idea of the, um, of, of the relative shortage of certain skills in, in this region, uh, about 70% of the people that we place into permanent technology roles, we actually bring into the region from elsewhere in the world. Where we're, so those skills are not necessarily here in abundance on the ground, but we're having to approach and relocate people from Europe, from Asia, from America and, uh, and, and Australia and so on. So what type of skills do those people have? Any, anything to do with, with Python, with, with Java, uh, apps, um, uh, app developments, uh, online payments. Um, there's been a revolution in the way we, uh, we consume goods and services. Um, it's, less high, it's less what we call mall driven and we're all, we're all buying a lot more online. And there's an awful lot of technology that sits behind uh, the ultimate service provider, being able to provide us with that, uh, with that solution uh, quickly and effectively. What, what would be the typical salary for these types of jobs? There is no typical salary. I mean, some of the roles we're filling in in, in technology are, are paying 30,000 dirhams a month. Um, some of the more senior roles um, in the very, very niche areas are paying upwards of 150,000 dirhams a month. So it's, um, the, the, there is no, uh, I would say there is no average. Um, but at each level of seniority, they are, they are well paid, I would say, and companies are having to pay top dollar to attract these people into the region. Just... Um... Yeah, you're talking about top dollar as well, but if people are sort of more looking for life work balance and would rather other benefits rather than just, you know, a high salary. Well, I suspect we're, we're all different, but the, 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 the first thing that anyone asks us about a job is what's it paying? They don't ask us, is there a you know, th- three days working from home? I think that's a nice to have that comes further down the track. Quite consistently, the most important um, aspect of a new job role that any any job seeker will ask us is well what's the salary because if there's a salary mismatch there's not really a lot of points in uh, in progressing so the, the people tell us that they are looking to change job for career advancement and to for a more interesting job and to learn and to develop in a role but very few people are prepared to do that for a lower salary so the, the salary increase gets gets bolted on as an add-on and then people start asking questions around things like the work-life balance so I'm not, I'm not saying it's important, and I think we've seen, a, we've seen an increase in uh, the number of people who are interested in that aspect of employment in our, in our survey. So, for instance, in our November survey, which I referred to, 78% of employees said that they hoped remote working would become more of a common feature in their organisation. Okay, that's interesting. Um, so we're still driven pretty much by salaries, which is, uh, well, you know, we need it anyway. That's, we need it. So. Well, that... that yeah, that, that's our experience, yeah. Uh, we, we see very few people prepared to move jobs to a lower salary. Uh, it's, that's, uh, that's just a, a fact of life, I'm afraid. What about, I mean, we've spoken about 2021. Do any of your, you know, sort of numbers that you're looking at now are giving you any insights into what we can, you know, sort of expect for 2022 in terms of the jobs market and salaries as well? Uh, I, I mentioned that um, in November, uh, about half of the um, employers that we surveyed expected their headcount to increase um, in 2021, and there's, there's, there's no obvious reason why that would be any different to 2022 unless something else comes along and interrupts it. I think the, there is a, there's a, an ongoing incremental increase in business confidence um, across, across the region. Um, I think the, the UAE um, is particularly well placed compared to some of the other countries um, that so where, so where we hail from, that we're very, very close to, which are still in various degrees of lockdown. I think the region and the, and the UAE is very well placed. And yeah, that confidence will continue to drive expansion and growth and, um, and more job opportunities. Absolutely. And that's very good news um, for, for us here in the UAE, I think. What about employees? Um, you know, you mentioned before that pay rises um, are, you know, more about being proactive. 
do you think that um, companies will be better placed to offer pay rises, you know, going into, you know, in the second half of this year and going into 2022 as the as the economy opens up? Uh, it's, it's a difficult one because you've got to remember that for most companies, the, the biggest single item of expenditure they have in their cost base is the overall salary bill. So if you're if you're a big company uh, with thousands of people on, on the books and you offer everyone in the business a pay rise of 4%, that actually aggregates up to being quite a substantial increase in, in cost. So I, I, clearly there are companies that, that do offer an across-the-board pay rise, but I, I still think that the, the best strategy for anyone who wants an increase in pay is not to sit back and wait for their uh, employer to come along and very generously give them a, a pay rise. It is to actually start asking questions. Uh, you know, if you have an annual um, career appraisal, for instance, and if you do, um, then ask ask your uh, your bosses or HR uh, where where am I going with my career? What's happening with my salary? Is there any opportunity for me to um, increase my salary? What do I need to do to get promoted? Um, and just be just be reasonably clear what the corporate view of you is, um, and hopefully you'll get a positive answer to that line of questioning. And if you don't, um, and salary is important to you, then maybe you do need to start looking for a job elsewhere. All employees will, will understand the rhythm of their company from the point of view of appraisals and assessments and, and salary reviews and, and so on. Now, if you're in a company that actually doesn't have them, and there are some of those around, then uh, unfortunately, it will be upon yourself, uh, the initiative is placed on you to actually make that first, um, uh, first, first contact and say, look, I, I need to have a chat with you as my manager, and I'd like to understand where my salary is going and my career and what I need to do to move on. Um, now, that might seem like a bold move, but the thing is that if you, if you don't do that, it's not going to come and find you. So you have to actually go and find it. Then in those companies that do have a, an, an annual appraisal, um, again, I think you need to go into those uh, well armed with information, um, external information around peer group and peer group salaries and maybe what's, what's advertised online. Um, and also well armed, as I have said before, about where you add value and have added value to the company. Uh, because in essence, it, from an employer's point of view, it's um, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a risk taking um, assessment. You know, are are they prepared to lose you from the business if you decide to resign and go and look elsewhere? And I think a, a, new, a normal human instinct is to try and look after those things and those people that make the biggest contribution and are of greatest value. So if you um, if you're confident that you do make a, a, a good contribution, then uh, shout up about it. Absolutely. What about bonuses? Are bonuses coming back or are they also on hold? I mean, clearly bonuses are only payable in a relatively small number of, of cases. And when we're recruiting at a, a senior to um, executive level, a lot of bonuses are discretionary. There's still not ink on the paper to say, you know, if, if we as a business make this much profit, then you will earn X. There's, uh, there's some quite vague language around there's a discretionary bonus payable at year end, and that's it. I think if, if there is talk of a bonus in your a newly negotiated salary package, I would ask the employer to put as much meat on the bone as possible so you, need, uh, you will know exactly what you need to do or what the company needs to do in order for that bonus to be payable um, because otherwise you may find that um, it, it eludes you, um, I, I would advise. One other thought uh, that I've just had, are expat packages shrinking? Uh, yeah, and I think that's been part of a long-term process, to be honest with you. Uh, we don't really see uh, an education allowance now as, as part of a, a package, typical expat package, unless it's, a, again, someone coming in maybe at board level or um, certainly into the senior executive team. Um, they, they are becoming pretty pretty standard packages, uh, I, would, I would say. There's, there's not really a lot of extra on top of a basic salary and housing allowance on, on the flight. Um, I would say the, certainly the majority of packages we encounter in the, in the middle ground, and by that I mean say fifteen thousand a month to say fifty thousand a month. Most are pretty normal packages now. Thank you this week to Chris Greaves. If you would like advice on your personal finance issues, you can write to me at pf at the national dot ae. And remember, PF stands for personal finance. Please do subscribe to Pocketful of Dirhams on your podcasting app to receive weekly updates and also leave us a review so we know what you think. This episode was produced by Arthur Edison and I've been your host, Felicity Glover. Hold up. 